What does the villain require in order to be interesting and impactful? Strength? Passion? Charisma? Surely those are important, yet there is one thing that can elevate any of these qualities. The power of first impression. Hello comrade, my name is Mahis. Come, get yourself a beverage and sit down with me. We got Muzan to praise. Kinda. This video was sponsored by absolutely no one, but you can support the channel through Patreon, where you can get hours of content featuring Machis in his natural habitat for a price of a fancy cup of coffee. Or you can join our Discord to catch these streams live for absolutely free. Links are down in the description. I have a confession to make. I used to think that Muzan was a pretty competent villain. Yeah, yeah, I found ways to explain his actions as something smart up until Entertainment District Arc-ish. The reason for that was his initial meeting with Tanjiro. It came out of nowhere, the demon daddy behaved like a chad, and it was a stark contrast to what we have heard previously. Case in point, when he gave this drunk two whole opportunities to fuck off, I had to pause and take a few laps around the house because I expected something along the lines of Tess's first appearance. Too bad they wasted all the setup that they have done with the smooth criminal and it's exactly why I want to start this series of videos. To put the villain in the best possible spotlight based solely on their introduction. During these analyses we'll break down the whole initial interaction between certain characters and the antagonist pretty much frame by frame with the assumption that everything was intentional. The scene starts with Tanjiro committing what should have been a crime against humanity and taking off leaving Nezuko as the only suspect. He power walks through the crowd Assassin's Creed style accompanied by some epic music and eventually reaches the source of this fine cologne. Well, I'll tell you what, you fat little the fact that RMC was able to touch him is actually quite significant. It shows how confident and relaxed Muzan is. He's an apex predator, nobody can scratch him, let alone kill, so there is no need to be constantly alert. Instead, he's startled by the sheer audacity of this kid and gives him a good look to figure out what his angle is. This is an obviously pissed armed demon slayer who somehow recognized him as a demon and is ready to attack. A lot of things could have happened here, if not for a child's voice calling out for her dad. Kibutsuji catches this brief moment of hesitation and decides to double down, almost asking, is this your kryptonite by revealing a girl in his hands? Notice how he doesn't turn all the way. He's not subjecting this child to any danger since he can easily defend her if something happens, kinda similar to Lloyd letting Anya sit way up high by holding her safely. Next part of the interaction is very important. Tanjiro is visibly shook seeing Muzan tenderly carrying a human who just referred to him as a dad. It simply doesn't compute and our big bad quickly puts two and two together. He doesn't even look at the guy with the weapon and simply comforts his daughter knowing full well that he has the higher ground. This is evident by the shift in his expression and blatant mockery of the newbie slayer. Is there is something I can do for you? You seem to be quite flustered. Hell, he even turns away to talk to his wife like if the protagonist didn't just pull a sword on him. Tanjiro is 100% defeated here because he has no idea what to do. Muzan was hyped up as this disgusting villain who not only killed the Kamados but has been spreading misery for centuries and there he is with a family of his own just having a walk. This is a cognitive dissonance face if I've ever seen one. On the topic of faces, look at that smug smile. He enjoys playing with his victim, which tells us that the King of Pop, uh, I mean the King of Demons, is definitely in there and is about to come through. He turns back to say that he hasn't seen him before, which is true, but he's also using this time to think of how to get rid of this twat. This kid was about to attack until he saw that there was a human involved. Well, why not give him more people to worry about? Boom! His movements were just subtle enough for Tanjiro to notice. He made sure to slow down a lot as we've seen how quick even the lower upper moons can be. With this move, Kibutsuji basically sent him a clear message. Fuck around and you'll find out. Sure, you might not value your own life jumping me like that, but you do care about others. And oh boy will there be others if you don't fuck off right now. Our savior had no choice but to leap into action, further exposing his soft side by not drawing his sword. Instead, he used his scarf as a cushion to not harm an innocent human who just happened to be turned into a demon. This completes Muzan's analysis of Tanjiro, allowing him to safely depart. 
He tells his family that it's too dangerous here and that they need to go, once more insulting the MC by leaving him to deal with the mess. However, Tanjiro speaks the name, making the progenitor realize that there is more to this kid and that he needs to do something about it. He covers it up with a standard I got to take care of some work in the middle of the night, sending his family home. Funny thing to notice, both the child and the wife seem to be quite fond of him, with the daughter even asking him to come back as soon as he can. This short scene paints the antagonist as quite a capable individual. He is obviously well off, likely owning an enterprise of some kind, that he is successfully concealing his evil deeds and that he may actually have an affection towards these people. Again, this reminds me of the forger situation where the facade is so beautiful that they want to make it a reality. Back to the plot, Muzan can finally focus on what just transpired. A random demon slayer specifically picked me out from the crowd, and judging by his expression, he had a bone to pick with me in particular. He even knew my name, and these Hanafude earrings, could he be related to- He apologizes, not because he is actually sorry or cares about this guy. No, they are inconsequential and only took up a second of his time. He had no intention of paying them any mind, let alone harming them, and this is where he gets grabbed in the same place for the second damn time. He still politely tells them to piss off because they are of no consequence to him. But as soon as they started to talk shit, it got personal. Not only did these drunks interrupt his train of thought and dare to touch him, they ignored Musan's attempts to resolve this peacefully on top of disrespecting him. Now they fucked up. He quickly dispatched the dudes and let the girl have it by letting out his frustrations with Tanjiro on her. He's triggered a bit, since this schmuck brought up his complexion and the previous one seemed to be a descendant of his nemesis. He specifically wonders if he looks like he is about to die. Which was a bit weird, until I've learned that he's still being burned by the Sunbreather sword from way back when, making it a major button that he doesn't like being pushed. So he vents, almost like talking to Yorichi himself, and does to the girl what he should have done to Tanjiro. Once everything is over, his mind is made up and he calls for his henchmen who are, of course, always nearby. The Miurkus won't let me lie, even if the big boss is able to clap everyone himself, he should still be guarded and or supervised just in case he may need something. These guys were likely told to follow him without acting and to wait for commands, which again is interesting because Muzan didn't call for them neither vocally nor telepathically and used a gesture instead. It's a common practice for protected people to use nonverbal cues that correspond with a specific message. In this case, a right hand finger snap means come to me, which they immediately do and receive an order to go fetch a head of the sprig. Naturally, they know who he is talking about because they just saw the whole interaction themselves. Kibutsuji even double checked if his instructions were clear, mostly to add urgency or importance to this task rather than being courteous. After all, an evil overlord shouldn't repeat himself. Demons formally concur and take off to do what they need to do while Muzan is recalling the past and how these earrings are setting his ass on fire both literally and figuratively. The takeaways from this first impression are plentiful. Not only is the antagonist quite cunning and takes control of any situation, he's just as ruthless as we were told before. He acts exclusively in his best interest even if it seems generous or polite. Moreover, he has demons and humans at his side, making him a very difficult opponent since he has a quick access to reinforcements or hostages depending on the situation. We can go deeper actually and assume that his visibly high status may be enough to affect the Demon Slayer core on a political or financial level and that we need to be extra careful not to implicate more civilians. Cause think about it, Tanjiro personally signed this family's death sentence as they are now an exploitable link to get closer to the Demon Lord which he 100% wouldn't much appreciate. Yes, I did say that he might actually like them, but business is business. He was I, Mahis, overanalyzing Muzan into the microphone. Have a great whatever time of the day you have. Until next time, cheers.